Hello world from Octopost headquarters. This is Radically Transparent, Octopost's original podcast show on B2B marketing now. I'm Jennifer Gutman, Director of Social Strategy, and in most episodes of this podcast, we'll feature B2B marketing leaders who will share their radically transparent truths behind being a modern day marketer and what it takes to grow ideas, take risks, and impact change. Joining me on this episode of Radically Transparent is Tyler Lessard, Vidyard's VP Marketing and Chief Video Strategist and author of The Visual Sale. Tyler, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. It is absolutely great to be here. I think this is the moment where I have to hold up a copy of the book, The Visual Sale, for those of you watching. Very excited, just launched this. So it's great to be here, Jen. We can't get our we cannot wait to get our hands on a copy of that book. Uh, I know I've seen pieces of it, um, and it's phenomenal. And we'll definitely dive into that in the podcast. Awesome. But before we get radically transparent, I need to ask you, is your background a Zoom background or or is that your new <laughs> office? <laughs> so for those of you watching, you can see what I look like. For those of you listening on the podcast, no, I'm not like on a fake roller coaster or something. <laughs> um, Jen's commenting on the fact that in my camera view, uh, I'm hopefully showing up very clear and bright and almost like I, real I feel life, like you're right in front of me. Like I'm right there. <laughs> and my background is automatically blurred out. I've got a plant behind me, a, a picture. And um, and the answer, Jen, is, is, is no, it's not a virtual background. This is my real background, but I'm now using a dedicated um, DSLR camera with a 30 millimeter lens on it as my dedicated webcam. And that's what's doing this. It's just a a beautiful camera that auto focuses and creates this kind of clarity. And uh, it's, it's a big step up, but Hey, we're all going to be on video for ever. Now <laughs> we got to figure this out. So I decided it was worth the couple thousand dollars. It's not cheap <laughs> to, to get a full setup and to, to make this happen. So for everyone reallocating or creating budget for their marketing budgets yeah. this year, uh, say that say the name of that camera again. We have to add it in as a budget line. <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, I'm using a Sony A6400 uh, camera body with a Sigma 30 millimeter lens on it. But I will let you all know. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Tyler Lassar. We're already at that point, like the end of the episode here, Jen. Um, <laughs> there you go. Connect with me. I actually have a post where I share all the specifics of my oh, camera phenomenal. setup because I got asked a lot of it. So there you go. Phenomenal. So listen, Tyler, I'm, I'm going to be radically transparent with you. Not going to lie. Um, I've had my eyes on Vidyard for quite some time because even before, you know, the crazy year that has been 2020, you guys have been doing some really interesting stuff when it comes to using video to explode sales. I've, I've received some of your sales team's videos, which are phenomenal. Um, and you know, I, I want to talk about this all. So I want to start though with those listening in. Um, maybe if you could start off, we'll give you an easy one. If you could get radically transparent with us about the backstory behind Vidyard, mm. what is Vidyard, and then how you found yourself there. Oh, this is a fun one. I'll start <laughs> at the very beginning, which was before I joined. I joined uh, a few years into the business when it was about 30 people or so. Okay. Um, but the uh, let me give you the, the origin story of Vidyard because it's actually super interesting. So uh, our two co-founders, Michael Litt and Devin Galloway, they were both engineering students at the University of Waterloo. Okay. Uh, and this is going back about 11, uh, 11, 12 years now. And as part of their life as students, they were looking for ways to pay their bills. To, <laughs> We've all you know, been get, there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do, do what they need to do. Uh, drinking money, whatever it is at that time in your your, your life at university, and uh, they uh, they actually started up a small video production company because they had had I know they're engineers, but they had had some experience doing like product explainers and things as co op students, and so they uh, they partnered up with another couple of people and they actually started a little video production company called Redwoods Media to help businesses specifically create explainer videos um, and product videos and to do them in a way that was typically less expensive than the big production agencies, which at that time were often still charging, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars just for a basic explainer. And um, and they had some early success with that. They they got some good clients. But as their end uh, as their last year engineering project, they decided to build their own custom video player 
so that um, they would be able to give their clients the ability to track more data behind their videos and say, rather than just embedding this video on a YouTube player on your website, um, we know that you as a business care more about just knowing how many views it got. So they actually developed as their, their school project, a, um, uh, a dedicated video player and a video hosting solution behind it Casual. that was focused on <laughs> analytics, to track who's watching and how long. And, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit, that ended up uh, becoming the, the genesis of Vidyard. They ended up expanding that out and creating a full-fledged video hosting platform. And they found they were better tech entrepreneurs than they were video producers. And uh, that's how it all got started. That's, that's quite the story. I know when I was a student, I did not found any company. So that's always inspiring. To hear. So let's, <laughs> let's fast forward. And, and, and how, did, how did you find yourself? Where, where were you before? How did you get there? What piqued your interest in joining? Yeah, so I've been here for just over seven years now, believe it or not. Um, but uh, when I joined back in 2014, I uh, at that time, I was at another startup, actually, um, that was more or less kind of coming to the end of its term. And um, and before that, I had actually spent a decade at BlackBerry running oh. their, uh, their global partner program. So okay. I'm an old BlackBerry <laughs> guy. But some of you may not know so- what that is. It was the... <laughs> The original smartphone, ladies and gentlemen, before <laughs> smartphones were smartphones. Do you still have a BlackBerry or have you have you come on over to the, the smartphone dark uh, side? It depends who's listening. If there's any other former BlackBerry employees, yeah, I still have one. <laughs> no, I don't. Then. I use an iPhone now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so anyways, we, uh, yeah, I spent a career at BlackBerry, another startup. And then um, in, in 2014, as that other startup was wrapping up, I got introduced to Michael and Devin at Vidyard, which is based in my hometown here in, in Kitchener, Ontario, outside of Toronto. And I was introduced through the investors at the company I was previously at because uh, they were looking for a marketing uh, leader at the time. And, uh, you know, I didn't know much about them, but after, you know, some initial conversations, it was one of those just like, I love the people, right? Like Michael and Devin as co-founders, you can just, you know, feel their, their passion and, and super smart, capable guys. Um, but they were also at a point where they had just hit that product market fit with their products and platform. They had just launched a strategic partnership with Salesforce and a couple of others. Um, and it seemed like a really great opportunity to, um, you know, get that experience of growing an organization from, uh, from that stage up. So it's been a, a wild ride the last seven years. We've gone from 30 employees then to 250 employees now and, um, you know, much bigger and, and better and, and global in nature. I think it's really exciting. You know, Octopus, we are also, you know, you guys are a little bit ahead of us in terms of the startup journey, but it's an exciting road. But with all of that excitement, there must be some worries or uh, fears. So my next question to you, Tyler, is, you know, in tradition with our podcast um, that we ask every guest, guest, uh, what keeps you up at night professionally, right? It's, there must be something. Yeah, well, there, there absolutely, there's a lot of things, Jen. Let's be, let's be clear. <laughs> okay. And it's not, ju- it's not just my kids. Uh, um, so, but honestly, and this, like, listen up, folks, because this is like the biggest thing that that I've learned, and I think is so important, but also is is terrifying in many ways, which is that challenge the, of not getting stuck in status quo. Of this is how we do things. You know, our 2021 plan is our 2020 plan with a little bit better, you know, a little bit more, right? Um, That's honestly the thing that keeps me up at night is thinking through our marketing and sales strategy and being worried that are we just doing things the way we do them because that's how we've always done them and we know that that's worked so we keep doing more of it. Are we missing out on opportunities to be trying new things, to be investing in new areas, to be working new channels, right? To be tr- changing our messaging. And, and I think right now, like more than ever, things need to change quickly. Like every year, every quarter, things, um, you know, we, we need to be agile in how we market and sell because just the ecosystem changes so fast, the channels, the expectations of audiences. Um, you know, six months ago, I thought Clubhouse was something in my backyard that my kids played in, right? And like, nope, not anymore. Uh, this is a whole new place. Are you so on there's, uh, it's wild, right? And that's honestly what keeps me up at night is the fear of being stuck in that status quo and 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 not experimenting with new ideas as much as we should be. Yeah, I think I think with that fear, right, there's not enough time in the day 
for, for marketing, right? I think that's one of the biggest complaints we'll hear from a marketer. There's not enough time in the day to touch and experience yeah. all of this technology, be where your users are. Um, so yeah, I hope you're getting a little bit of sleep. Um, <laughs> we'll get back <laughs> into that in a moment. Um, but I wanted to, to throw out at you, I was reading uh, somewhere that, you know, when it comes to, we were talking about how you got started at Vidyard or how the co-founders with um, explainer mm-hmm. videos. And I had read a stat that those who watch an explainer video are 74% yeah. more likely, and keep me honest that I have this correct, but 70, 74% more likely to buy compared to those who don't watch that video. And that's, that's mm-hmm. pretty high. Um, can we yeah. kind of dive into that, um, take a look into that because from what I'm seeing as well, like tweets in, from the social media world, right? Tweets with videos see 10 times more engagements and LinkedIn users are seeing 20 times more engagements when a video is being shared and, you know, we'll see it, right? You can check it out when we post this podcast in MP3 versions and the MP4, you'll see where the engagements get heavier when they see our faces, um, so it is clear. I think a lot of us marketers know that video boosts conversions and sales, but can you help us understand the real secret to using them? Because right, not all videos are going to explode yeah. sales because if they were, I think every salesperson right. would be with your camera and, you know, giving their, <laughs> you know, pitch or yeah. whatever it may be. What, what's the secret sauce here? How are we going to do this? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's really interesting, and and you think about you know the explainer video is a good example. We can all relate to that, right? Most of our businesses have explainer videos, or or we've seen them from other companies, and even just that gives you a you know a good appreciation for like what is that special power of video? And there, there's a couple of things that you can glean from your average explainer video. Okay? Number one is that video is a more educational content medium than other formats because of how our brains process visuals and sound um, and, you know, the storytelling kind of arc and narrative. And so in watching a two minute explainer video, you can typically learn more than you could by reading for 10 to 20 minutes because of how we're processing those visuals and we can sort of understand how things fit together. So it can very much be a more educational medium. And a lot of that is in the power of visuals, but also in that ability to show and narrate and do all those things together. Um, so that's really, really important for us as marketers, as well as for salespeople, where a huge part of what we're doing today for many of us is trying to clearly educate buyers. And if we just keep sending them PDFs and white papers and blog posts and text-based emails, yeah, it might get their attention. Yeah, they might read some of it, but their ability to actually process and retain and interpret that information is nowhere near if they had that same thing through told through a visual storytelling video. So that's a really important thing. Number one is it's more educational. Um, the second is that video gives the opportunity to share and induce emotion, right? Much more than any other type of content. And then that can be everything from making somebody smile, making somebody laugh, um, inspiring, right? There's all sorts of little emotional triggers we can play with and pull on when we're using video. And, um, and, and it goes on. I have uh, something in my book actually talking about- I was going to say, like, is, is, if we all go- and grab a copy of the visual sale. I mean, this is the premise yeah. of the book, right? Like you're you're really giving away some some of your secret sauces oh, there. Yeah, I'll know? stop there. Okay. There's the four E's I gave away: educational okay. and emotional. There's two more, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that you'll have to pop over the book for. Um, but th- that's like really the power here, right? Is that um, is it is a different medium, and it can be used to its strength and to its advantage. And that's what marketers and sellers need to start to appreciate. And the best news, though, Jen is that we no longer have to spend $30,000 to make a video. We don't have to like buy expensive gear. You know, I make videos at home all the time. We're putting them out there. And these sort of micro engagements are great ways to build our brands, to connect with people and to clearly explain ideas. And I think it's really powerful. I would, I would have to agree with you. And I'm dying to ask you and kind of, you know, throw a curveball at you when we mentioned clubhouse earlier, right. And this kind of clubhouse yeah. kind of right. Everything you're saying, I, I completely um, relate to, yep. right? I see a video, I'm a very visual learner and, and I've been giving clubhouse a go and right. It's, there's no, right. There's no face interaction. There's no video. Yep. So this may be your, the visual sale part two. Um, maybe, you know, we'll have a book about clubhouse in a, in a, <laughs> a few years. Um, but I think it's interesting where, where this new trend technology in terms of kind of what you're speaking, yeah. is heading, and we can touch on it. We can pass it over and, you know, 
hop on a podcast another time, but it's really interesting to me. Um, with yeah. that, well, I, I mean, Jen, the, the big thing I just want to, I just, I think it's a really important thing to comment there because, um, things like clubhouse are important. Things like written blog posts are still important, right? It's, you know, we're, we're video has its place among other things, but the real underlying challenge that we all face as marketers and sellers, um, it's, is that buyers and our audience's expectations, their preferences, the way that they engage has completely changed, you yeah. know, since 10 years ago. And it's, it's continuing to change even compared to 12 months ago. And that's where, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about this of if, you know, a blog, you need a blog because people are expecting to be able to come in there and, and search and find. You need a high level inbound strategy and be on YouTube and other places. Podcasts and Clubhouse are great places because, yes, your audience does, in many cases, want to click play and listen in a passive experience in the background. In other cases, they want to lean into a video and learn really specific things. So all of these become an important part of how we market and sell today. And I think that's where I'm like, I'm still, like, it keeps me up at night. I'm like, are we thinking about all these different channels and, and, and formats because our audience is living in so many different places now? I really appreciate that you've said that. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll have guests who come on and you know, they give great insight from the companies in which they're at, but you know, there's that, that kind of, okay, you know, in your case, you know, you're, you're video art and video, video, yeah. video, but you know, you're, super transparent about the fact that we need to be where our buyers are and video is one place to be and let's do it right. And all the other channels and forms of communication to incorporate in there. So I, I really appreciate that insight. And I thank you for, for being transparent about that. <laughs> um, so we're going to shift a little bit to social media now. Um, mm -hmm. So for as long as there have been companies, we know that there have been executives calling the shots. And uh, Tyler, VP Marketing, Chief Video Strategist, you're pretty pretty high up there. And sure. I know today there's a lot of talk about how do we, and we spoke about it, right? Like how do we break that status quo? Yep. And one shift that I know that I'm seeing on social media is how companies and specifically leaders um, yep. from those companies are taking a more active role on social media in the form of thought leadership. So maybe before when they were making decisions or a sales journey or a sales process or a sales funnel or where, whatever you want to think, think of what was maybe behind closed doors uh, yeah. a few years ago that it was, you know, nobody was really sharing it publicly because it was their own treasure to, to make and hit targets and revenue. Go on social right. media and CMOs and CEOs are sharing right in front of your face. Like you feel like, wait a minute, if I do this, you know, <laughs> what will the result be? But they're sharing a lot of interesting learnings, findings, failures, successes to help the community on social do what they do better. Um, can you maybe share a little bit about your perspective on what you think or how you think uh, the C-suite or leaders should yeah. be approaching this kind of topic um, and, and dive into a little bit your personal brand on social and yeah. how you're molding it? Yeah, it's uh, it's such a fascinating area right now, isn't it? This because because the social networks um, and you know that's inclusive of all the things we would think about. And, and in my world, I think about things like LinkedIn, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and 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 so on. But even Instagram, like TikTok, these are all becoming platforms for us as a business and for our executives for uh, for their communications. And what's happened though over the last number of years is they've gone from being you know, how shall I put it? They've gone from being a place where like basically static content gets posted and shared to a platform for content delivery and discovery, right? Which is really interesting because even LinkedIn, it's hard to, you know, hard to imagine, but only a few years ago, it didn't even support video, right? And it was a very different <laughs> network at that time, but it was like three years ago, there was like LinkedIn didn't even have video and uh, it was a very different network. It was, you know, static content and, you know, all of a sudden now that video has been a part of it for a little while, it's become this like much more dynamic, much more engaging, much more personal um, kind of a network where people are building brands, where they are creating a level of transparency with their audience, where they're enabling and empowering their people to become evangelists. Because by the way, a lot of people out there like to follow other people. They don't like to follow other fans, right? 
And so, and, and they, they trust that and it's more like, it, it feels like less like a brand presence on a social media network always tends to be associated with, I'm going to get marketed and sold to, right? And the majority of what they share feels like, I'm, you know, they're trying to pitch me something. But if I follow an executive at that company, that's my opportunity to almost have like a, a transparent, you know, dialogue and view into that organization. And it, it changes the way that that network is used and it changes the way people interact with you. And now instead of it being like, oh yeah, I'm getting updates and promotions, it's like, I'm, I'm getting insights. Um, I'm, you know, hearing interesting uh, ideas and I'm connecting with the real people at these organizations to understand what they're all about. And I think that's the real opportunity. And as we move more and more towards this world where like authenticity and trust and, and, you know, transparency are all more and more important, you know, we could have a whole conversation about that, but I believe all of those are increasing in importance and having executives on social media doing this using video and other forms of content is really, really important. Um, and it's a really big opportunity to, for, for them to help build the network and build the community, but to then also be a channel to share insights, to share ideas, and to uh, create a more personal relationship with these audiences. And I think you're missing out if you're not investing to some degree in, um, in a social media content and almost personality and brand strategy for your executives. I 100% agree with you. I think where sometimes many of us get stuck um, is, right, you know, Octopus tagline, we make it measurable. So here you are uh, pumping out for your executive team, yeah. whether you have ghost writers or you yourself are writing and you're publishing onto social media and you're, yeah. you know, putting your, your treasure trove of, of insights into the network. But even when it comes to videos, right? Like, let's say I've seen some great CEOs kind of sharing their thoughts in videos. And, and I, I, I'm, I scroll, I'm scrolling on the infinite scroll and I get stuck on their videos and I'm watching their videos and what yeah. often goes through my head as a marketer is how on earth <laughs> do you measure video performance and how can you even yeah. measure the impact of video in a sales or marketing funnel on yeah. social or in general? Like, what are you looking for? How are you measuring it? What's the ROI? What should we be looking for? Or let's say we want to incorporate video into our strategies how are we going to pitch this to our executive leadership if this is what we need and the ROI it brings? Yeah, well, it's a big question because <laughs> um, the way that you measure it, like any other form of content effectively, is that um, the way you measure it is against the goals of the specific you know, content or, or campaigns that you're running. And the, the, the reality is video now serves a lot of different purposes throughout the buying journey. And so you have to be mindful of when you're using it in different places for different strategies, are you set up to be able to, number one, like get the most out of it as a medium in those channels? And then number two, to be able to track back and understand, is it helping me achieve my goal that it's, you know, that it's built for in that specific um, program or channel? So for example, on social media, yeah. often the goal in using video is going to be to increase reach, to yeah. increase engagement, and to also see a trailing um, uh, sort of positive indicator in terms of followers and community building. And so we say, great, the more videos we do, are we seeing more engagement, more followers? And if that trend continues, we can all agree it's a positive impact because of all, all the things that we would know. So that's one easy way to do it. And um, it's, it's always hard to know like specifically which piece of content had what impact, but <laughs> that's where you give it over a period of time. And, you, and that's the importance of also being consistent and saying, you know, like every week or twice a week, you're going to post a video on your social channel and we've got a schedule for things. And then over a three to six month period, we can sort of see, did it have a material impact or not? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really important part of it. But if you flip over and say, that explainer video on your website, right, that we talked about earlier, that's not about getting broader reach. That explainer video is about converting people on your website and generating pipeline and, and creating a closed deal. And so in that case, if you're hosting that explainer video on a YouTube player, all you're going to know at the end of the day is it got X number of views, which really means what nothing. Does that mean, because right? that's just, yeah. yeah, it's just like how many people were on my website, right? Um, and so it's, you know, it doesn't tell you anything, but that's where, you know, video platforms like a Vidyard and others will help you track who watched that video, how long did they engage, 
and they'll push that data back into your marketing automation and CRMs. Mm. So you can track back and know, oh, yep, I can see the these goal. people watch that video and I can actually see that they turn into pipeline or turn into revenue. And you can start to measure those uh, types of goals as well. Absolutely. I think that's that's the that's the important piece, right? That's what's missing today. You don't want data living in a silo as a marketer. The hardest part, I think, is getting insights from your data and using them and putting them into action, yeah. right? We have tons of tools that can spit back the data, but I think that's key, integrating with the CRM and marketing automation. So spot on. So with that, um, we have a few questions left. And this question, I always like to learn from my guests because, you know, failures are such an inevitable part of successes. And I see Vidyard as one of the most successful companies that I follow on LinkedIn. You guys have really engaging content. Every person I've ever spoken with from your team, they're kind and they're informative. Um, what is maybe one failure you may recall? It can be at Vidyard or in your life prior to Vidyard um, that you feel has really helped you be successful today that at the time you might've been thinking or making the face of like, uh, I don't know if I made the right call there. <laughs> you know, one of the things as a, as a, as a marketer that I reflected on recently was I made a big mistake for a number of years, but well, a couple of years, let's say, uh, <laughs> of underestimating the importance of like, conversion optimization and sweating the details, if you will, in things like our digital programs and others. And, um, you know, at the time I didn't have an appreciation as much for it as well myself. And I didn't have the right team members, you know, in digital marketing and others that came with that experience. And so, you know, I would talk to other marketers and, you know, it would be like, how do I, you know, get Bill more? And they're like, you know, well, how's your, you know, how's the conversion of this page on your website? And I'm like, I don't know. I think it's pretty good. We got, you know, some form fills last week. And, uh, and I started to dig in and I realized, oh, yeah, there's this whole discipline of like conversion rate optimization and, you know, continuous testing of these little things to see, you know, how can we impact, you know, 1% at a time and how important those things are uh, in the long term. Um, I've always been sort of you know, the big idea guy and like, oh, we need to do this big thing. But sweating the details on all those day to day micro things mm -hmm. um, are so important. And again, I know that I made a number of mistakes there early on. And then the best decision you could have made is bringing in people who have that expertise and are a lot smarter than me in these areas and can go, oh, yes, no, here's how it works. Here's what you need to do. Here's how we're going to test it. And here's how we're going to incrementally improve like every day. And the results have been unbelievable with those teams from a website performance, from an SEO perspective, uh, all of those kinds of things is, uh, is so important. I love how you talk about the marginal gains because I think it can also be overwhelming when you're listening to fellow marketing community members talking about their successes or right. you know their programs and you kind of forget like hey listen this is a a small 1% a day change small little changes to make a big impact and you can lose sight of that and I think especially when we're all working from home and we're all kind of in our little worlds um, yeah. I, I think that that is something, it's a big take home for me that I know I'll walk away from hosting this podcast, remembering, you know, Tyler, incremental change and, and, and yeah. adding that 1%. With that, um, I was wondering on this podcast, if you could share a little bit of insight into Vidyard's 2021 social media plan and what we can expect from you guys this year on social. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's actually a really fun time for that. We are... Um, you say it with such a smile. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. It's kind of like a half smile because I was about to say we are, uh, we've, we're expanding the channels that we're investing oh. in directly. Okay. Well, one of those is, and, and my like weird smiley face is because <laughs> TikTok is one of those, which every day I'm like, oh my God, do we really need to be on TikTok? Uh, but we do it. It's funny. We started, you know, we're, we're doing content on TikTok that's getting a tremendous amount of engagement. Are they the right people? We don't know yet, um, but it's, okay. you know, having a, a really strong impact from a brand perspective. Okay. Um, but I think related, related to that, the biggest thing we're doing this year is investing in targeted content for each of those different social networks. Okay. And something that I've learned as well over the years is, you know, a social strategy isn't, creating what's piece of content and then sharing it on all the networks. It's saying, okay, what are we doing here on LinkedIn? What are we doing on Facebook? What are we doing on Instagram? What are we doing on TikTok or others? 
and, you know, creating content specific for those networks. And as a B2B brand, it's, you know, not a lot of people are doing that, to be honest. So that's a big focus for us now. And um, it's, it's combination of video and other formats that are really designed for those channels. So everybody listening, make sure to go give Vidyard a follow of your channel of choice, if you will, um, so we can keep an eye on what they're up to. They're really, like I said earlier, this is a company that every time I find you guys on social in my feed, I stop scrolling for a moment. So if you want to look at how social should be done, this is a great company to take a look at. And in my last question, it's my favorite question of the show. Um, right. So I did my due diligence. I know you have a book. Um, I know you have a great, uh, video personality. You've done videos. You have a great team. Would you be able to tell us something on this podcast about yourself that we can't find on your LinkedIn profile or if we Google you? Oh, um, (laughs) well, I have, uh, I mean, I have four kids at home, which is something most, you know, you probably wouldn't glean from my, uh, from my, from my professional content They're they're between the ages of five and 13. Um, so it's like, it's amazing. I love it. I, I love being a father of four. They're incredible kids. But what is so interesting about that, um, is like, it's like my own little, um, you know, focus group here at home where I'm like watching them you know, their habits, like how they're interacting with things, their, their use of video, their use of social media, and, uh, you know, how they've responded to the pandemic. And it is so fascinating just to see this generation um, and, you know, this truly digital first, video first, social first um, generation. And, uh, you know, how it is that they experience the world, how it is they connect with people. Um, you know, they're all ready, willing, and able to hit the record button and make a video at a moment's notice. Whereas all of us in the business world, we're like, I don't know about that. I got to like myself on camera. And it's like, it's a whole new world. So it's really fascinating. And uh, yeah, something that I, you know, is, is obviously a big part of my life. I, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love when family meets professional life. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from kids. I myself have a 22 month old who just now is transitioning oh. from a crib to a toddler bed. Um, I'm surprised we didn't hear him, but I I can definitely attest that a lot of my professional work is being influenced in a positive way by how I watch him playing and exploring. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, for our listeners out there, um, don't forget the visual sale. You this you have to add this book to your reading list in 2021. Tyler, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to many more conversations together. Great, thank you, Jen. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopus, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopus. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopost on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.